This is a tough passage to hear, a little tough to say thanks be to God at the end of it. Anyone who thinks that Jesus was docile or meek or just a first century kind of hippie has missed some of these important passages in our scripture like this. Jesus starts out by telling the story of an act of empathy and generosity and kindness where a king forgives an unimaginable amount of debt that's owed to him. And then the story flips to one of greed and callousness and torture over a seemingly insignificant debt. And, and it's sort of horrifying to think that someone could actually behave so badly. And then immediately Jesus turns on us as the reader and says, so this will happen to you if you don't forgive from your heart. And to top it all off, Jesus started this whole passage by saying, this is what the kingdom of heaven is like, which is kind of hard for some of us to hear who have a decidedly more humane vision of the kingdom of heaven, one that doesn't involve torture. But you've heard me say before that when it comes to parables, just when we think we have one figured out, we're usually wrong. So I think this is a hard passage because Jesus' answer to Peter's question about forgiveness, that we must forgive 70 times 7, seems to be a concrete one. Forgive or be tortured. It sounds very binary. Binary in the sense that there is a right, wrong answer. Good, bad behavior. And we have a tendency to like binary thinking because it feels safe to us. You know, if there are two roads and one's the right way and one's the wrong way, I know which lane to stay in. Unless, of course, I want to go down the other road and then there's a whole package of guilt that I have to deal with. That's a different story. So think about this for a moment. Everything that we know about God says that God does not torture people. God loves expansively, unconditionally. God doesn't torture us. We do a pretty good job of that all on our own. So I don't think that Jesus' parable in today's scripture is meant to be a binary choice, forgiveness, torture. I think it's a call to a deeper relationship with God and with people. One thing I know is that sermons on forgiveness run the risk of being a little preachy. Like we should all just let it go, just let it go. But honestly, doesn't that seem like a message better suited to an ice princess in a Disney movie? Because forgiveness is messy and awkward, and our egos are always wanting to justify why it's unnecessary. We say things like, well, that was just unforgivable. Or, well, that person's just angry and inhospitable all the time. Or, but my feelings were really, really hurt. We deplore their actions even as we defend our own. But Jesus has given us here in the Gospel of Matthew a mind-boggling goal, 70 times 7. And as much as we can intellectually accept that Christian forgiveness is e an essential marker of our faith, we have a very hard time accepting that we have anything close to the kind of capacity for forgiveness that Jesus expects. Desmond Tutu was asked by a reporter some years ago about the concept of forgiveness, especially as it related to the oppression of black people during apartheid in South Africa. And the reporter said, I understand forgiveness, but tell me about genocide or torture. Are those things forgivable? And the archbishop said almost apologetically, he said, I'm afraid we follow a God who says, Forgive one another as I have forgiven you. So he said, that's our standard. 
And I think that Archbishop Tutu was apologetic in a way because like every human being who's ever chosen to follow Jesus, even the Archbishop knows that that is one ridiculously high standard. So we don't have easy step-by-step -step instructions on forgiveness. I'm not gonna stand up here and tell you, here's how you forgive, or you should forgive more, or you're not forgiving the right way, because there's no right or wrong way to forgive. All I know is that Jesus says we need to. And therein lies the tension in this good news message for today. Jesus, in answering Peter's query about how many times to forgive, goes directly to the heart of the matter, which is all about relationships. Note that Peter asked specifically, how many times should I forgive my brother who has done something to offend me? He was asking about an almost familial relationship, certainly a relationship that was in his sphere of community, one that needed reparation. And that's an important distinction because even though forgiveness certainly does extend to structures and nations and religions, Peter was concerned with community and specifically people in his community. So Jesus' answer to forgive 70 times 7 basically underlies the value of being in right relationship with people. Not hardening our hearts to them, but expressing and exhibiting love to those who are in beloved community with us. So we forgive for several reasons. First and foremost, we forgive because we are forgiven. Let's not forget that. When Jesus, for example, saw the faith of the men who brought a paralyzed friend for Jesus to heal, he said, I have authority on earth to forgive sins, and yours are forgiven. When a, a certain woman found out that Jesus was going to be having dinner with the, a Pharisee at, at his home, she went into the home and began anointing Jesus with oil, kissing his feet, weeping, over him. And despite claims by the Pharisees that the woman was a known sinner, Jesus commended her actions and her faith and said, your sins are forgiven. And then Paul wrote in Ephesians, get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, outcry, and slander along with every form of malice. He said, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as Christ forgave you. In the letter to the Colossians, Paul wrote again, bear with one another and forgive each other just as the Lord forgave you. And he added, above all, express love, which is the perfect bond of unity. So over and over again, we get this message, forgive and love. Forgive and love. Which brings us to the second reason I think that we forgive. We do it for the sake of others. You've probably all heard a child or even an adult say, but she didn't even say she was sorry. How can I forgive someone who isn't sorry? But maybe a better question would be, can the other person be really sorry and repent without your forgiveness? Consider Jesus hanging on the cross. No one had repented when he called out, forgive them, for they know not what they do. That kind of love and grace is totally disarming. It opens up the possibility of reconciliation. Forgiveness, whether spoken out loud or not, can actually strengthen someone else's desire to lean in to that discomfort of repentance. And it is discomforting. It's not a guarantee that they're going to repent, that they're going to apologize, because we can never be sure of someone else's response. But our forgiveness offers the space. Now, I can't help but point out here also what I think is fairly obvious, 
And that is if I go to someone who has wronged me, whether intentionally or not, and I say, I just want you to know I've forgiven you. They might construe that they're being accused of something that they didn't even know they did. And it can also sound a little condescending or patronizing if we aren't careful. Forgiveness is really, at its heart, an inside job. Which is why the third reason that we forgive is for our own well-being. We don't always in life get the option to face, for face-to-face -face apologies with someone. Sometimes someone dies, or they move, or they're simply resistant to reconciliation. And in those cases, forgiveness has to be more of an embodied emotion, something we do for us. And why? Because the alternative to forgiveness is usually bitterness. We're so busy sometimes with the past hurts and wanting revenge or wanting to be heard and made right that it chains us to the very act that happened in the first place. Not to forgive means we get to suffer the torment of yesterday's hurt over and over again. We don't escape from the hurt and the pain because it's all we can focus on. And when we do choose revenge, when we choose to hurt back, well, then we just have to face our own capacity for cruelty every time we encounter that person or that memory. Our revenge hurts everybody. You've probably heard it said that when we live by the rule of an eye for an eye, eventually the whole world would be blind. Gandhi said that, and so did Martin Luther King Jr., quoted, quoted it during a speech in 1963 when he was describing an episode where he and his brother were driving one day on the highway, and it was evening or nighttime, and he said for some reason it was either a slew of discourteous drivers or people were forgetting, but no one was dimming their headlights. And Dr. King said that his brother finally spoke up and said, well, now I'm getting tired of this. The next car that comes by here and refuses to dim the lights I'm going to refuse to dim mine. And Dr. King said, now wait a minute, don't do that. If somebody doesn't have some sense to dim the lights, we're all going to wind up destroyed on this highway. Somebody has to have some sense. Only forgiveness really sets us free. And we can practice forgiveness in, in the dimming of our headlights for people, or in those small moments where, where little annoyances begin to fester. It's an opportunity to practice, not an eye for an eye, but forgiveness. But forgiveness is not passive. It's not submissive to wrongdoers. It doesn't let bad behavior off the hook. We don't and shouldn't risk becoming a doormat by forgiving every offense. Things happen that shouldn't. People behave in ways that are bad, sometimes because they don't know any better, and sometimes because they don't care. There is injustice. There is intentional pain. There is cruelty. There is evil. So yes, there is a time to get angry and stay angry. There is a time to insist on change. There's a time to say, enough is enough. We are called to practice forgiveness, but don't let's make the mistake of thinking that that equates to accepting bad behavior. And what about the kind of wrongs that are so egregious as to be unforgivable? How do we let bygones be bygones when it comes to things like terrorism, genocide, social oppression, abuse, as one writer I know put it, we are made in the image and likeness of God. We were made for a just and nurturing world that honors our dignity. When we experience any deviation from that basic goodness, it is appropriate, it is human and healthy and Christian 
to react with horror. And I would say that we have before us an excellent example in Jesus. Remember Jesus cracking the whip and throwing over the tables in the temple. Remember him calling out to religious leaders that they were a brood of vipers for their hypocrisy. Remember Jesus making strong statements to the Roman leaders about the politics of the day. Remember how he called out the mistreatment of the vulnerable and beleaguered people in his society. Jesus takes sin very, very seriously. The bigger it is, in fact, the more it demands our attention. And yes, the harder it is for us to step into the fray of forgiveness. We like our little seats of judgment. We are really good at issuing armchair judgments on the injustices of the world and on the big hurts that have been done to us. Forgiveness is so hard, which is probably why Jesus said, don't stop at the number seven. You see, number seven represents completion, and the work of forgiveness is never complete. Some of you, I know, are dealing with very, very difficult things, things that you find nearly impossible to forgive, heartache, abuse, trauma, wrongdoing, oppression, harm to your families. Some of you have been victims of war, victims of terrorism, or you're suffering because someone close to you suffered those things or you've lost them to these things. And I want you to hear this right now. Forgiveness is a process. It is a sometimes long and arduous process. And I think that what Jesus is saying here is that we may need to forgive the same hurt again and again and again. Each time that it bubbles up within you, each time that you're reminded of the pain, each time that you just wish things could be different. But there's no timeline on forgiveness. It takes as long as it takes. It will be complete when it's complete. But it is the work of brothers and sisters in Christ. And I think it's how we change this path of anger and intolerance and disunity that we're currently seeing in our world today. If you are struggling mightily with forgiveness, don't you dare think that you aren't spiritual enough or religious enough or that you haven't prayed hard enough. Forgiveness is hard work sometimes. All that's asked of us is that we keep trying, that we keep practicing. Because if we don't, the consequence is being tortured, being in a prison with our own resentment and bitterness and rage. Forgiveness represents hope that no situation is intractable. Nothing is beyond repair. You and I, and the world, we are forgiven. May we eventually be people who forgive those who trespass against us. So I'm going to ask us now to just take a moment of silent prayer, and I invite you to just ask God to release the chain of whatever it is that has been done to you, whatever wrong you're harboring in your heart, whatever it is that you'd like to forgive. And just in this moment, imagine what it would be like if you were free from that, free from that pain, that hurt, that heartache, that resentment, that anger. So let's ask God's help as we pray. <laughs> 